Tiffany is a very neon 80s name, and not without reason. It exploded in popularity during the decade, but despite Tiffany's modern sound, the name wasn't born in the 80s. Tiffany is at least 80 decades old. OMG, that's like positively medieval. How is that? And then why? Why is this? Well, let me tell you the tale of tracking Tiffany through time. It starts in the year 300 with this guy, Eusebius, a historian and bishop in the Holy Land. He wrote a treatise on the divine manifestation, and the word for that in the Greek he wrote was Theophania. In ye olden days, religious virtue names were totally a thing, and Theophania became a name given to children born on the Feast of the Epiphany, though no five-syllable name can go unnicked, so for some rhyming sage, a Tiffany Epiphany was inevitable. The name, thus born in the Holy Land, then spread with the Greek language. The most Attends. famous example appears in 972 with the Empress of the Holy Roman Empire, whose name is written this way and probably pronounced the opening. Ancient pronunciation is a whole other thing that we are going to skip because it's unknowable. And it doesn't help that the Empress's name is listed in different ways, so it's impossible to know if she okay. went by Teofanu or Theophania or Teofania, which are all close to Tiffany, but not quite. Who knows? Maybe she shortened it and her title was Tiff, Empress of the Empire the top tip. But that's just speculation. When this word first became a Tiffany name precursor isn't exactly known. Spoiler for history, pre-printing press, there's not a lot of written evidence for anything, and lots of documents that did exist got lost. So to tell the totality of the tale takes trusses of trust betwixt the islands of evidence. It's time to try to find the true old-time Tiffs by working backwards through hundreds of years of census books. And <laughs> if you did that in English, you wouldn't find much. Thanks for nothing, Doomsday Book. But if you also looked in French, you could find Tiffany Raganel, born 1335, about Prince. whom all information is delightful. A noble lady astrologer who lived in France's fairy tale castle Mont Saint Michel and who used her astrological powers to predict the outcome of her husband's knighting battles. Hey, honey, maybe we go on that one? And she was righter than wronger because he survived to ascend to become the Grand Constable of France, first officer of the crown. On the island, there's still a little museum to her and her husband, though one thing you won't find in that museum is her skull, which which turned up just a few years ago in a relinquery box in the town of Dinan with a note on it saying this is the skull of Tiffany Raganel and Jeez. given anonymously to the local library. So that's a thing that happened. Wait, why are we talking about this? Oh right, because this is the oldest Tiffany that's pretty much spelled Tiffany and about whom details of her life are known. But were you to keep going backwards through the census books, you'd also strike a trio of Tiffany's in Paris in 1313. But all that is known about them is their listed professions, waxmaker, washerwoman, and spinster, a woman who spins spool into three. Red. Thus, this foursome of French Tiffany's written records are the proof that Tiffany is totally neon medieval. Though you might be wondering exactly how did a Greek name from here end up on a fancy French Tiffany over here. Me too. So if you kept looking through every old document that might be a oh. list of names for hundreds of hours, if you were lucky you would eventually stumble on the transcripts of charters related to Gilbertine houses from 1161, containing a single Tiffany, well, Tiffany with an EPH, but that's close enough to count, who lived in fourth be England. How did she get there? Well, we must cross another truss of trust, but uh, Tiffany had a grandfather named Hugh, who was at just the right time and place to travel to the Holy Land in the First Crusade. And going through the surviving records of Crusaders from the time, there are candidate Hughes. And while I can't prove the Tiffany-Hugh connection 100%, which kills me, I'm still calling it that Grandpa Hugh on his travels came across an epiphany Tiffany and brought the name back to Middle England in the English language, as also did French Crusaders to France. It all fits. But it does leave the question, if Tiffany in its modern form is near a millennia old, why don't we think of it that way? Probably just historical happenstance, a lack of famous Tiffany's. There were no queens born on the Epiphany to be named Tiffany, leaving Teofanu as the most prominent Tiffany, except not exactly a Tiffany, and Tiffany Raganel isn't particularly famous, until hopefully now, that is. If you go on your own French <laughs> Tiffany crusade, be sure to tell them Grey sent you. So, aside from these two, the name never landed on fame to pop in popularity like it would later, just sporadically showing up in written records in the late 17 and 1800s. Which, as an alternate history side note, it does mean that at the time Jane Austen was writing Emma, the name Tiffany was infrequently around with its exact modern spelling. So, if the authoress was looking for an underused name with literary potential, she could have picked Tiffany and turned the Georgian and Victorian eras neon as well. And I mean, come on, the name Tiffany Woodhouse is totes perfect for the character. But sadly, it didn't happen 
11 and Tiffany remained a name without fame. She would get there, but jumping backwards, she first needed to transform. In 1629, Tiffany does appear on an English census, finally, this time for the first time as a last name with one Mr. Henry Tiffany, who lived and died in Hackney, oh, London. Okay, Tiffany. so he wasn't born a Tiffany. Were you to track down his christening, you'd find he was Henry Tiffin at the time. But once grown up and married, the record now shows him as the first of the family of Tiffany. Why the name change? It probably wasn't one. Consistent spelling in the English language totally wasn't a thing back then. None other than <laughs> Tiffin Tiffany's contemporary William Shakespeare never spelled his signature. <laughs> Spelled correctly. the same way twice. English was, and still kind of is, very whatever with the written word. So Henry Tiffin became Tiffany Random Lee, and because the world is just too perfect sometimes, I'm also calling it that this Mr. Tiffany, the first to appear with the last name in the English language, is directly responsible for this explosion of Tiffany's 400 years later. Come with me. So Henry Tiffany had a son in 1630, Humphrey Tiffany, okay. who moved to the shiny New England sometime before 1660. Humphrey Tiffany took the name to America. America and simultaneously removed it from England as a last name, as he was Henry Tiffany's only surviving son who would also have a son, James Tiffany, in 1666. From there, James Tiffany Jr., 1697, to Ebenezer Tiffany, 1734, to Comfort Tiffany, 1777, to 1812, yeah. Charles Lewis Tiffany, which has caused That's a lot of in the audience to light, but to follow through, Charles Lewis Tiffany, with some friends, established a stationary and fancy goods emporium shop named Tiffany Young and Ellis in 1837. Charles Lewis Tiffany eventually took control of the company, changed the name to Tiffany & Co. This line of Tiffany goes down to the company. To focus on jewelry exclusively. Well, except for that period during the Civil War when he switched to manufacturing swords as the Tiffany experience, but after that, back to jewelry. From the late 1800s, this New York City store for Tiffany was Up her most now. prominent placement since the Empress or the Astrologer, and it remained so until 1958 when Truman Capote walked by. The name caught the author's attention as underused with literary potential, and he wrote and published the novella Brett breakfast at Tiffany's. Prior to this moment, Tiffany as a first name was holding on but barely, averaging under 10 babies a year. After the novella, there's a slight uptick in the name, but that could be a coincidence. But what definitely isn't is in 1961, the novella became a movie starring Audrey Hepburn. And it would not be understatement to say that this role turned her into a time-transcending Hollywood icon forever connected with the name in the title. Tiffany had found her fame, and the following year, the Tiffany's Quinn toppled, setting a solid base for an exponential explosion and grew over the next 20 years as okay. children grew, having seen the movie, to have children of their own, bringing us to 1979 and there are almost 10,000 Tiffany's a year. Now, we are still on a trust of trust for this Tiffany theory. Maybe it wasn't the store turned story turned movie. It could have been a coincidence. If you look at enough random events, you can always draw some convincing correlations. But remember that in ye olden days of the 60s and early 70s, movies could only be seen in theaters. But by the late 70s, there was a new invention, VHS, the video home system, mm -hmm. so you could watch movies anytime in glorious form. Yes, yes, Deb. And, well, guess what? Breakfast at Tiffany's happens to be the first Audrey Hepburn movie released on VHS in, wait for it, 1979. And one year later, total okay. Tiffany's doubled, rolling into the 80s torrent of Tiffany's, where the name was top 20 for nine oh, out of, of ten the years. The Tiffany ascendancy that that had started with theophany in prehistory. And that is the tale of Tiffany. She's carried her neon torch through the ages and long may she carry it into the future. To yeah, Tiffany. It's nice. The long history of that name Tiffany existed a very long time ago. I'm hilarious that that name Tiffany was out that movie. It was a little video to watch. I love how he did all that research for that name. I had to be told that I was a separate movie.